I'm going to talk today about one of the most emotionally difficult passage to read in the Old Testament, and yet it's an unforgettable story, and it's Abraham being tested by the Lord to see if he truly has put the Lord first in his life, and the test is extraordinary. Let me read it, Genesis chapter 22. Sometime afterward, God put Abraham to the test and said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son Isaac, your only one. Remember how long Abraham and Sarah waited to have their own child Isaac and what a long journey that was and how special it was that finally they were able to have their own baby at, at quite an advanced age. And going to the land of Moriah. Moriah, incidentally, is, think, is thought to be the place where the Temple of Solomon was built and where, uh, very close to where uh, Jesus was crucified. There, offer him up as a burnt offering on one of the heights that will point out to you. Whoa. Being asked to sacrifice Isaac? in whom all the promises are supposed to be fulfilled? What was that ever a test of faith? Early the next morning, Abraham saddled his donkey, took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac, and after cutting the wood for the burnt offering, set out for the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham caught sight of the place from a distance. Abraham said to the servants, Stay here with the donkey while the boy and I go on over there. We will worship and then come back to you. So Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac. It, it reminds you of the wood that was laid on the shoulders of Christ because what we're seeing here is a type of the sacrifice that was offered for us by the father giving us his only son. So Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering, laid it on his son Isaac, while he himself carried the fire and the knife. The two, as the two walked on together, Isaac spoke to his father. Abraham, father, he said. Here I am, he replied. Isaac continued, here are the fire and the wood, but where is the sheep for the burnt offering? My son Abraham answered, God will provide the sheep for the burnt offering. Then the two walked on together. Wow. So somehow Abraham is convinced that even though it looks like this is the end of Isaac, that God's going to provide a substitute sacrifice. When they came to the place of which God had told them, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. Next, he bound his son Isaac and put him on top of the wood on the altar. Then Abraham reached out and took the knife to slaughter his son. Oh, but the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he answered. When the Lord calls us, as painful as confusing, as impossible as it may look, we need to answer like Abraham did because he's the father of faith. Here I am. Here I am. Well, do not lay your hand on the boy, said the angel. Do not do the least thing to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you did not withhold from me your son, your only one. Abraham looked up and saw a single ram caught by its horns of the thicket. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering in place of his son. Abraham that place named that place Yahweh Yira, as people today say, on the mountain the Lord will provide. Well, this is a pretty, pretty shocking 
Some ways difficult to understand, some ways not difficult to understand. But our faith will be tested. And what does our faith have to be like to pass the test? It has to be real faith, which means faith in God, faith in Jesus, faith in the Holy Spirit, understanding who they are and what kind of response to them constitutes the kind of faith that Lord, the Lord is looking for. The Lord tests our faith in order to strengthen it. So what does this mean? That means we have to put our own Isaacs on the altar. We all have Isaacs. We all have things, people, places, possessions, hopes and dreams where we place our trust in, our hope in, our desire for. And many of these are wonderful and good things. But the Lord clearly says that what it means to be his disciple is to unmistakably, unreservedly have him as the controlling influence in our life, have him first in our life. You know, the uh, scripture passage that I've mentioned so often over the years that's been so important to my wife and myself, Luke chapter 12, Jesus saying, unbelievers are always worried about what they're going to eat, what they're going to wear. We might th throw in the kitchen sink there, whatever the future might bring. But I say to you, seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God and his holiness, and these other things will be added to you as well. Because your heavenly Father knows you need them. As I've said many times in the past, this is not the prosperity gospel. This is the sufficiency gospel. God will give us what we need, what's sufficient, so we can accomplish the purpose which he created us. But that means putting the second place things in our life in the second place. And putting the first thing place in our life in the first place. Now... Jesus really brings this home in his teaching. First of all, he says, don't be afraid of those who can kill the body. But rather, This is from Matthew chapter 10. But rather be afraid of those who can kill the soul and body and send it down to hell after death. So this is a radical call not to put the first thing in our life, preserving our life and living indefinitely. He says, no, the first thing in our life should be not to offend the Lord, not to grieve the Lord, not to disobey the Lord. And Jesus says, don't be afraid of those who can kill the body, but after killing the body, can cast it down into hell. And then he goes on to say, do not think that I have come to bring peace on earth. What? 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 I mean, the, this is the Prince of Peace. This is the one the Christmas cards are all about. Yes, but the way Jesus brings peace is through conversion, repentance, and us and everybody else making him first in our life so that everything else in our life and all our relationships can be integrated, can work in harmony with God's will for the human race. God's will for the human race is peace, but sometimes it comes through pain, through separation, and through difficult, painful choices. Do not think that I have come to bring peace on earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foes, a man's enemies, will be those of his own household. Oh, that is a painful situation. Jesus is saying, there, there will be division, and there needs to be division. And if somebody is more important to us than following Jesus, that person is an enemy. Hard words, but really true. And that we got to put Jesus before any of our other most precious, most beautiful, most blessed relationships. Now, the good news is that if the people in our life are also putting Jesus first in their life, these things can work in harmony. You know, how beautiful is the family that puts Christ first? How, how fundamentally peaceful are those people who have their friendship based in Christ? 
That's what Jesus is asking for because, not because he wants to take us away from anything good. It's because he doesn't want us to sell our birthright for a mess of porridge. He doesn't want us to cling to those things that can never satisfy us because they're creatures. They're the creation. Only he can really satisfy us. Only he can heal the wounds of our soul. Only he can fill that infinite longing for love and security that we have in our life. Only he, and he wants us to have it. He wants us to have him. He who loves father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. Oh, my goodness. None of us are worthy of Christ by our own merits or virtues. But Jesus wants to make us worthy by us abiding with him and resting in him and letting him prune us and letting him purify us and letting him heal the wounds of our soul so he can be more and more the one who fills our life. You know, those beautiful and challenging words in John chapter 15, where Jesus says, I'm the vine, you are the branches. If you stay connected with me, you're going to bear much fruit. And the Father is going to prune you so you'll bear more fruit. Some of that pruning is our faith being tested, our, our priorities being tested, our loyalty to Christ being tested. But then he says, the Father is going to prune you and you're going to bear more fruit. But if you don't abide in me, if you don't stay connected to the the source of transformation to the Holy Spirit to sanctify. If you don't allow God's word to purify you, to deliver you from fear, to deliver you from clinging to things that are less than him, you're going to dry up, wither away, and be cast into the fire. He who loves father and mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. I think some of us are failing this test. Some of us may have sons or daughters who emotionally manipulate us, who tell us that if we don't approve what they're doing, they're going to not love us anymore. They're going to leave the family, and we cave into that. That's, that's a way of denying Jesus. Yes, we, we want to stay connected to our sons and daughters, but when our sons and daughters are turning away from the Lord, we can't say that's good. We can't say we're going to support you in that. As painful as it is, we have to say, look, I love you. But the reason why I can't support you in what you're doing is because I love you. And there's going to be pain in that. But we should never stop loving, never stop hoping, never stop praying and offering sacrifice for the salvation of our children, for the unity of our family. And he who does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. Now, what are some of the Isaacs? Well, obviously here, the closest personal relationships. And nothing can become before Christ, even our closest personal relationships. Money. Money is our Isaac. We need to put our money on the altar. We need to let God order it. We need to make sure it's not an idol in our life. You know, Francis de Sales says, you know, one of the ways to make sure it's not an idol in your life is to give some of it away, even when it hurts. And, and Francis says, you know, you never can outdo God in generosity, but while you're giving away, while you're making a sacrificial offering of your money, it hurts and you feel it. And then normally the Lord restores it, just like he, he did with Isaac. The Lord provided the ram. Popularity, what people think of us. A lot of us fear the opinion of people more than the opinion of God. We've got to ask God to deliver us from fear of men. And, and have that holy fear of God that keeps our priorities straight. Now, I want to finally say a few things about that phrase from Genesis that Abraham said to his son, My son, God will provide the sacrifice. God has provided the sacrifice, and it's a, a sacrifice without price. It's a sacrifice that could scarcely ever be thought up. God loved the world so much, he gave his only son up to death and crucifixion. There's a, there's a, 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 a truth in the scripture that says there can't be the forgiveness of sins without blood. And the bloods of animals in the sacrifices in the temple couldn't forgive sin. The only sacrifice precious enough 
to make up for the rebellion of the human race against God and all the ugly, dark, hurtful, painful things that go on every day. The only sacrifice that was sufficient to reconcile us with God was the bloody sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. God provided the sacrifice. We, we, we don't have enough on our own to be pleasing to God. God provided the sacrifice that allowed us to be reconciled with God. Now, Jesus and the Father and the Spirit have done everything for us that we never could have done. But he wants us to connect with it. And he's actually left room for all of us to participate with him, with our poor sacrifices, joined to his perfect sacrifice for the salvation of souls. That's why Paul says, you know, I make up in my own body what's lacking in the suffering of Christ. There's absolutely nothing lacking in the suffering of Christ except his desire that we participate in it by joining our pain, our suffering, our sacrifices uh, to his suffering as a prayer joining with his mighty cry for the salvation of the world with her own prayer and sacrifice. You've heard me say this before. Mary of Fatima said, so many souls are going to hell because so few people are offering prayer and sacrifice. So let's join our suffering, our sacrifice, with the sacrifice of Christ. We do that every day as we you know, make our bodies a living sacrifice and everything we do, offering it to the Lord, uh, the morning offering that's been popular for many Catholics over the years is a way of saying that that's what we want to do. We want our whole life to be pleasing to the Lord. We want every part of our life to be in harmony with his plan. And so I, I just want to say that the story of the test of faith of Abraham, he was willing to give up his Isaac. The Lord didn't ultimately require it of him. But it did require faith. It did require a knowledge that Abraham was a reliable servant that was putting him first. So we need to take a look at our Isaacs and put them on the altar. The Lord probably will not take them, but the Lord probably will give us the grace and the strength and the wisdom to order them properly under his lordship. God bless you.